I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that screen share? Great. Should we do music? I know I've done it in the past. Last time I tried to do music, I couldn't share my screen and do music in the, at the same time. No, never mind. Unfortunately. It's a good idea. I just can't figure out how to do it on my computer. Okay, I'm gonna start letting people in. Hello all, um, I'm ho I hope everyone's doing well this evening. Um, welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us. Um, the Pleiades Visiting Writers Series is very excited to um, present readings by Shara McCallum and Catherine Nuremberg this evening. And the readings will be followed um, with a brief Q and A. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jenny Mulberg. I'm co-editor of Pleiades with the wonderful Erin Adair Hodges. Say hi, Erin. <laughs> um, hi. We'd like to thank the School of English and Philosophy at the University of Central Missouri, as well as the Missouri Arts Council who sponsor sponsored this event. Um, and if you haven't already done so, please check out our new fall issue of Pleiades, you can subscribe on our Pleiades website or purchase a single copy. It's a great issue. Um, so while our two authors read this evening, I'll be posting, um, I'll be posting uh, links to purchase their books in the chat. Um, you'll be able to get signed copies of those books if you'd like to. Um, and Without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to our student, my wonderful creative writing student, Cassie Rodenbaugh, who will be introducing Shara McCallum this evening. So thank you, Jenny. Hello, everyone. So I'm Cassie. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Shara McCallum. I recently read her newest collection, No Ruined Stone, for my poetry course and was blown away by her use of language and representation of culture, both Jamaican and Scottish, uh, with history and poetry. It's a beautifully creative look into the history and life of Robert Burns, who is a very famous Scottish poet, um, and imagining how history would have changed if he had, as he planned, sailed to Jamaica and worked on a plantation that exploited the labor of enslaved people. In her wonderful poem, Rising, McCallum writes, to encant the names of the dead is to invite the charge of treason. So silence becomes the cost of extracted from every man who labors beneath the boot heel of history. So that's just a little taste of what's going to come. Uh, the book, which came out earlier this year, is Sharon McCallum's sixth collection, and we really enjoyed discussing it in class. In the words of Evie Shockley, Sharon McCallum brings her gorgeous poetics to a story of slavery and colonialism, challenging the historical archives' sheer, unyielding wall by going not over or around it, but fearlessly through it. McCallum's use of persona through epistolary poems imagines the letters between the invented characters and Robert Burns and challenges us to think about the ever presence of colonialism in our canon of Western literature. I can't wait to hear her poems in her own words through this reading tonight. Um, McCallum is from Jamaica and born to a Jamaican father and Venezuelan mother. Her, she, she is the author of six books published in the US and the UK, including No Ruined Stone, which came out this year. Her poems and essays have appeared in journals, anthologies, and textbooks through the US, Caribbean, Latin America, Europe, and Israel, and she has awards for her work, including the Silver Musgrave Medal, the OCM Bocas Poetry Prize for her previous book, Bad Woman, 
a Witter Biner Fellowship from the Library of Congress, an NEA Fellowship in Poetry, the Oran Robert Perry Burke Award for Nonfiction, and the Agnes Lynch Sterrett Prize for her first book, The Water Between Us. She's on the faculty of the Pacific Low Residency MFA and an Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of English at Penn State University. McCallum was appointed the 2021 to 2022 Penn State Laureate. During, and during her tenure as Laureate, McCallum is delivering readings and events throughout Pennsylvania and elsewhere in the US, in person and virtually, and is hosting the weekly radio show, Poetry Moment on NPR affiliate station, WPSU. Thank you, Shara, for visiting us today. And I can't wait to hear you read. Uh, everyone, if you can please join me in welcoming Shara McCallum. Just a little, a little clap. And I'll turn it over to her. Kathy, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, your generous words. And hello, everyone. I know Zoom is a substitute for us being together, but I'm hoping after we get this reading, I'm really looking forward to reading with Kate and hearing her. I've never heard her before. And um, I thank Jenny, Aaron, and everybody affiliated with Pleiades for hosting me. Before I begin, I just want to remember to say that. Um, I'm mostly looking forward to the conversation. So I'm going to read um, in the 15 minute to 20 minute max time frame so that we can get to that. Um, I'll start with the first point in the book, which Cassie gave such a great summary of the, you know, what the book is premised on. I don't think I have to say so much with this one. Um, the you of the poem is Robert Burns. The me is Shara speaking here. I say that because most of the poems are not voiced by me but the first and the last, which are the title of the book, No Rune Stone, are decidedly in my voice. So this is the first, No Rune Stone. You saturate the sight of those who come after, poets and painters alike. Your words invade my mind's listening, manacle my tongue when I try to speak on all I backward cast my eye and fear and cannot see. Who would I have been to you? What stone in the ruined house of the past? In this world, I am unloosed, belonging to no country, no tribe, no clan, not African, not Scotland. And you, voice that stalks my waking and dreaming, you more myth than man, cannot unmake history. So why am I here resurrecting you to speak when your silence gulfs centuries why do I find myself on your doorstep knocking when I know the dead will never answer? So that was the first poem I wrote after three years of researching this book. And after saying that the dead will never answer, as Cassie mentioned, I go ahead and I resurrect Robert Burns anyway. Um, he lives out the last 10 years of his life um, in the fate that he very narrowly escaped, which is going to Jamaica, as Cassie mentioned, to work as an overseer seer of this, the work of enslaved Africans on a real plantation, Springbank. Um, I, I'm gonna read the poem Cassie mentioned. I never decide what I'm gonna read really in advance. I usually start with Noro and Stone and kind of feel it out from there. So Cassie, this is for you. And um, I will just say that Taki and Nanny they are Maroons, figures in Jamaican history, um, basically enslaved Africans who went into the interior and eluded first the Spanish, then the British. Those are the Maroons. His brother Gilbert is who he's often writing to in this collection. And I think that's all I need to say about this. Rising. Day and night, the mountains speak. From distant fields lit by fire, day and night, comes the drumming that will not cease, fomenting fear in every planter, stirring restlessness and desire amongst the slaves. Nearly three decades have passed 
since Taki's rebellion failed, and Nanny, now rumored dead. Yet memory survives, their spirits roaming these hills as the threat of the next rising gathers like rain clouds on the horizon. To encant the names of the dead is to invite the charge of treason. So silence becomes the cost extracted from every man who labors beneath the boot heel of history. Dear brother, this letter will never reach. Like so many thoughts of late, they are as fragments of dream thrashing in my head. Or should I commit even one rashly to the page, I would fast tear that sheet to shreds, burn it to cinder and ash. Soon enough, I will be called to account for my sins. So what could it matter to confess them to you or any other? Brother, what would I say in truth but I have borne witness to, been reluctant participant in madness. I have watched as all of us are bound by fate, cruel twine ordained, not by any law of God or nature, but of this world we have designed, this world where profit is the first and last word. Violence, both rule and reason. So that's toward the end of Robert Burns' section. And I'm gonna to skip to the second half of this book. Um, I, I will say more if people are interested in the origin of this and the research and how it developed, but suffice it to say, I never meant to write the second half. I thought I was always going to write the what would have happened strictly in Robert Burns' timeline of his life, kind of an intervention into the real history, but sticking to those 10 years, 1786 to 96. Um, the first voice I heard was Isabella's, and I didn't know who she was, uh, but I knew she was not of that place and that time. And I wrote this second half for her to give that voice habitation, a body and a story. And I think you will learn some of that if I just read a few of the poems. Suffice it though to say, if you haven't read the book, it does work as a narrative across the collection. Um, Isabella's grandfather uh, father is Robert Burns. He has a relationship with an enslaved African woman, Nancy. Their child is her mother and her father is the owner of the plantation who rapes her mother. Isabella, when her section opens, is 19 years old. We are in Scotland. Her grandmother has just died. And um, her husband, she is recently married, does not know the truth of her history because she has been passing for white. Um, I'll just read a couple points in her voice and give you a sense. Actually, I'm just gonna read one in her voice. And then I'm gonna read one for Aaron's class about witches. I changed my mind. Um, so this is Isabella's spring bank. Burns has one too, but this is her version of the plantation looking back. Spring bank was all the world I'd known. A child there, I was hers, Miss Nancy's kin. No matter this skin, these eyes belonging to his face. Your father could not look at you without seeing disgrace, was the only answer she'd relent to offer. Even when her life waned, she would not unlock the past. Tell me what she'd said that made him let us go, why he paid and paid to send us away and away. We left first for Kingston and a door closed behind us. A door 
I was never meant to open again. In Kingston, my grandmother was passed off as my slave. By the time our ship docked in Greenock, she was my servant, and we threaded into a tale so tightly woven, no one would guess my origin. What she sacrificed was everything of herself to see me freed. But my father, you kent him and his world so intimately. What I've surmised will be no surprise. What Douglas understood was expedience. I was simply evidence. I needed to be erased. And the poem I'm gonna read that um, is the one poem in this collection that is actually in Isabella's grandmother's voice is because in many ways, she is the presence across this entire book um, in my mind, who's the most formidable. She speaks once, but there's this notion of um, slavery in which the enslaved were completely powerless, which belies the truth of slavery. And Isabella's grandmother, Nancy, amassed great power on that plantation to the extent that she learned traditional Western, um, West African medical medicine, obia, religious tradition, and that Douglas even became afraid of her is what happens in her narrative. So even after she's dead, she comes to speak to her granddaughter. As Isabella's section goes on, she's struggling very much with what is the cost of passing. There is obviously the privilege, right? She has escaped slavery. She is entitled to this life that only white women at that time could have lived. Um, but the cost to her is to betray her ancestors. And that is the question that is haunting Isabella in her half of this book. Um, and when she is struggling with whether or not to tell her husband the truth to begin with, her grandmother comes to her. And this is Nancy. At the hour of duppy and dream, Miss Nancy speaks. You think what lies before you asks more than you can bear. But I am with you now as I was when you came into this world, your one eye looking forward, the other forever looking back. From the netherworld, you were flung into this one, squalling, full of that scent we could not wash away. Your mother's breath extinguished as you gulped your first. The call swaddling your face till we lifted it, unveiling, beholding the unasked for, girl child cast down in a place of stone, of men who cannot see to see, do not hear what needs listening, men who have riven borders and nations and you, in whom the rift has opened. Hear me, for I was there in the beginning. Witness as you entered, as you came dusking, tearing all asunder, rending the fabric they call truth. And, um, the reason I was thinking about that poem, if it's not already self-evident, um, is that I think that women who operate outside of the realm of um, understood traditions of truth and knowledge often have been considered dangerous, i.e. the witch, um, the obia woman. So I was just thinking about that, Erin, after you were chatting when we first were coming on, that maybe Nancy's power <laughs> derives partly in that. Um, the kind of memory that is haunting Isabella, by the way, is not only her own. There's a real seamlessness here in this book between dream and real, um, the lead living in the dead, and also between kinds of knowledge and ways of being. 
So I just say that before I'm going to read just one more poem, the last poem in the collection. And um, this is me again. After Isabella's the arc takes place, I come back one more time. No ruined stone, and it's from my grandmother. When the dead return, they will come to you in dream. And in waking will be the bird knocking, knocking against glass seeking a way in, will masquerade as the wind, its voice made audible by the tongues of leaves greedily lapping as the waves self-made fugue is a turning and returning. The dead will not then nor ever again desert you their unrest will be the coat cloaking you. The farther you journey from them, the more distance will maw in you. Time and place gulching when the dead return to demand accounting. Wanting and wanting and wanting everything you have to give and nothing will quench or unhunger them as they take all you make as offering then tell you to begin again thank you Shara, thank you so much everyone's give her a big round of applause again such an honor to hear you read and actually hearing Isabella's voice really come to life. Really just absolutely loved it. I got chills. It was like, oh my goodness. Um, but thank you so much, Shara, again. Um, certainly last but not least, we are going to introduce Catherine Nurnberger. Um, it's a great honor that we are welcoming Catherine Nurnberger here tonight. I first fell in love with Catherine Nurnberger actually whenever I had a class with Professor Adair Hodges for her um, nonfiction class. Um, for my first encounter with her essay. Oh, is my speaker on? Okay, it is. Thought someone said I wasn't. Okay. Um, from her first encounter that I had with her was the essay, The Avengers of Mothers, from her latest collection of essays in The Witch of the Eye. Um, I was instantly craving more. In a world where women have not had a voice, Nurnberger really gives the voice to those who have been silenced over centuries of patriarchal injustice while discovering a voice of her own. Um, one of the quotes from the invention of mothers is, quote, in these places, men, it is said, beat the ground in disgust. Women pour milk on the ground at the mention of her name, end quote. Another quote from one of her essays from The Witch of the Eye is the invention of witches, quote, to have a soul is to flutter about spoiling the milk, destabilizing the script of how we talk to each other, end quote. I never thought that I myself would be a poet, but discovering Nurnberger's creative nonfiction um, lyrical braids and then reading her latest co collection of Rue, I absolutely fell in love even more with Nurnberger and her compelling words and how it finds itself around nonfiction sources. Um, Catherine Nurnberger's uh, latest book is The Witch of the Eye, so those little sneak peeks quotes that I gave you, we love those, definitely go check it out. Um, but Witch of the Eye is about witches and witch trials. Um, she is also the author of poetry collections Rue, The End of Pink, and Rag and Bones, as well as a collection of lyric essays, brief interviews with the romantic past. Her awards include the James Laughlin Prize from the Academy of American Poets and the NEA Fellowship and a notable essays in the Best American Series. She teaches poetry and nonfiction for the MFA program at the University of Minnesota. It is with great pride that one of our very own is here tonight, who's a former creative um, writing professor here at University of Central Missouri. So everyone, please help me welcome Katherine Nurnberger. Summer, thank you so much. You're so thanks to Erin for teaching my essays in your class. Um, Thanks to Jenny and Erin for having me here tonight. It's really exciting to be back doing things with Pleiades after a few years away. Um, I wanna say hi also to my friends and colleagues at UCM. Um, it's very nice to see your names in the boxes here. Um, 
And it's a real pleasure and honor to be reading with Shara tonight. Um, I didn't know there was a new book of poems. I'm gonna go order it as soon as this reading is over. Um, so um, let's see, since Aaron has requested which poems, um, I'm going to skip all of my poems about um, with curse words and vaginas and go for witchy things instead. So I'm gonna start by reading a poem called um, When We Dead Awaken, um, which I dedicated to my friend Maya, but it feels like it could be dedicated to Aaron and Jenny too. Um, when We Dead Awaken. When you look at a long wave of kelp stretched out as if it were a mess of some drowned girl's hair, you won't be thinking of the functionality of the ovoid bladders like tiny buoys holding the flat wide blades towards the sun for maximally efficient photosynthesis. You'll be thinking of that time you almost reached to hold the hand of a man as he told you that story where two teenagers don't fuck on the beach but do find the corpse of a pregnant girl washed up on the sand. The wind on the bluffs of everything we didn't do felt crisp and clear, but down below on the gray beach, Sand fleas would swarm you as you walked among dumps of seaweed and shore battered crab husks. I know because I walked the lip of it alone at the end of this. If you feel like you're in love, you have to either remember or forget that a feeling can only last a little while. What you should do with your little while, I can't say. The history of should is the history of honorable men discovering Caribbean beaches with white sand and water as blue as mermaids eyes where they dragged human beings down the gangplank in chains to finance the invention of coffee shops and decorative buttons on ladies' shoes. The coast I have in mind was so ashen and the pines were brown with the fire drought of the end of our present world. I should have taken his hand. I've already been a pregnant girl washed up on shore twice. The bull kelp are so big I thought I was looking at a dead squid the first time I saw one. I asked the shoulder of him I wanted to lean my head against if he thought that was even possible. He said, anything is possible. You don't understand how long it was. I had been dead by the night of that day, Maya took me to her lake at the edge of the peninsula, daggering this gray sea. It is a lake so old, a glacier carved it right down to the bottom of the basalt earth. When you jump in and you have to jump in, the cold stops your heart for a second. And then it comes back in a seizure of beating that makes your vision blur. That is also a feeling that can only last so long. A boyfriend threw his dead girlfriend in Maya's lake once in the mineral waters iced over that night. When spring came nine months later, the fisherman found her floating in the water as perfectly beautiful as when she went in. They call her Lady of the Lake and she haunts the place as a ghost or a witch or a very old God who still remembers how to want and how to grasp what she wants with the ice of her hungry fist. It was night, I couldn't get the stars to hold still. I couldn't catch my breath. I was 1,000 miles outside of my life. How long since I felt anything? And now there was nothing I could not feel. I could see beyond the sails and red lights of the Coast Guard buoys, the flashing tentacles of a hundred, a hundred squid rising up to taste the silver of that strange moon before the surf hurled them in lumps at our feet. I have a dead daughter I carry like a smell of salt spray in my mind. And I have an alive daughter who is home running with her kite straight into the wind. I have, but also do not have the rest of you. I don't see how we can be longer than a story to each other. It's not me, it's the waves. My arms are so tired, I just need to float for a while. There was no squid, it was a rack of seaweed bulbs. Their squish stems wrapping in each other, strange creatures, soft as leaf, firm as fish, forming of themselves a forest against the physics of diffusion and drift. If I had that night back, I'd do it wilder this time. Not like the silent mist of a ghost maiden, but like a red-eyed revenant who has figured out at last how to reach across the veil of breakers and grab the girl of some dying woman by the heart and make her beat until she's gasping once more. Um, and this is not a witch poem. It's a, it's a little bit of nun poem, um, but mostly I was thinking when I was deciding what I wanted to read tonight, um, when I taught at UCM, I had a lot of nursing students, and I don't know if that's still sort of the case in, in this Zoom room, but, um, but I was thinking about all those students, and I've been thinking about them a lot. I know COVID has taken rural Missouri communities and hospitals through the ringer, and I've just been hoping that those um, aspiring healthcare workers that were all in my survey of American literature classes are holding up under this unbearable burden. Okay, um, so this is a poem 
I guess I, I wrote anticipating them someday. The unicorn tapestries. In the Renaissance, there were the masters who could do skies, their parting of clouds, their terrifying wings of an angel were the feathered breaths of a reflected light. They had apprentices to do the foxes and rabbits, gerbils and fawns gathering in the grass around the saint's naked feet. In the ICU, I marveled at his mouth without dentures or muscles, how everyone who dies opens their mouth this way. Everyone who dies this way, it seems, does it on the edge of morning, perhaps so that after we can walk out into the beginning of a day with his watch in a pocket, dragging heavy in a way he is not. Or maybe he is just so happy. On the lawn of the hospital come these fat rabbits to graze and roll on their backs and scratch, stretch to scratch themselves, to make you imagine their purring. What had been raccoons rattling the perkful end of night are now the school sisters of Notre Dame, some still in wimples, all in skirts to the knee, dark nylons and orthopedic shoes, pushing walkers or holding each other by the elbow on the way to chapel. He shared their nursing home. It was an endless source of amusement to him to tell the other lays and residents, my last home should be a convent. My first had 11 sisters. They would know soon and cry a little for him as they do for someone every morning of their lives in this assisted living wing tucked under the hospital shadow. Two floors above us is the resident who, in the moment of crisis, put in the tube and the needle and the smaller one and the other one, who waited to see all the lines beat their slow rhythm and then called the people who would have wanted to hold his hand when he was afraid and she, the only one there in the empty quiet of the graveyard shift. Did she speak to him as she worked? I think she would have. When we were ready to ask, she pulled out that huge tube from his throat. He didn't even cough. You could almost see her through the glass, whited light by morning. She's drawing out the rest of her work, the catheter and the IV and the little box around his finger. She's lifting the weight of him with the corners of a blanket, first his head, then his feet. She is the one who will pull up the sheet. I read her name on her ID badge and for a moment I knew it, but forgot. Even though I could tell it was a name I would always want to remember. The name of this most cherished of strangers from a morning when I cherished everyone I ever knew or didn't. When I wanted to hold the hand of the person who dappled in the tufts of violets and dandelions. These rabbits that are such plump bodies. You have to find a way to paint their heft to show how there is a weight in there that swallows the light, not to reflect it right back. Um, and since it's almost Halloween, and since that was very sad, I'll try to end something, something a little lighter. Um, so this is a little essay about witches. Um, and I think of it as also being an essay about um, generosity and where we might find it. called Glas Geblin. The people were obsessed with milk. The people were obsessed with ways to stop the witches from stealing the milk. So great was their obsession that the Malleus at Maleficarum, that handbook for inquisitors, devoted an entire chapter to the subject under the heading, here followeth how witches injure cattle in various ways. The witches, it was said, make a thing called a tilbiri. First, they steal a rib from a recently buried body, then wind it up in wool stolen from beneath the shoulders of a widow's sheep. They tuck it between their breasts, and for the next three Sundays at communion, they spit sanctified wine on the thing, watching it grow more alive with each spit. When grown enough, it sucks the inside of a thigh, and when it is finally weaned, it can be sent to steal milk. Each night, it returns to call at the window, full belly, mommy and vomit the stolen milk into a butter churn. The witches turn into rabbits and suckle the cow's teeth. They turn into butterflies and their fluttering sours the cream. They turn into owls or flies or dogs or cats for the sake of creeping on that milk. They call it through spells into their own pails. They ask and then torment anyone who will not give a glass. They make a hair rope by nodding, by nodding severed cow's tails and then tugging that rope while repeating the charm Cow's milk and mare's milk and every beast that bears milk between St. Johnston's and Dundee, come it to me, come it to me. Before there was nature as a concept separate from the world, before there were sugar plantations and coffee plantations and tobacco fields stretched out to the horizon, before there were cotton gins working their gears as fast as a pair of scarred and aching hands could feed them, there was the story of Glasgow Bleen and the beginning of milk. 
The history of milk is a history of unexpected gifts and unexpected consequences. Though relatively common among those of European descent, lactase persistence is a genetic abnormality that allows adult bodies to process lactose. Just a one standard deviation increase in the emergence of this genetic variation is associated with a 40% rise in population density as milk's fats, proteins, vitamins, and minerals added balance to pre-colonial diets, creating economic and population booms, followed only later by the density corrections of famine, war, and plague. Before there were witches or demons or God the Father in his heavens, before telescopes or microscopes or manuscripts were carried across those mountains that divided the monasteries of Europe from the monasteries of the Middle East, before the priests began to tremble at the smallest voice in their heads wondering if, the people told how Glasgablin, the divine cow, gave a rich cream and her udders never ran dry. She could walk the island of the world in a single day. The rocky burn was made by her hooves and she fed all whom she met. No one ever starved when she was around. So of course the people tried to enslave her and take her abundance for themselves. When she left for the stars, only that creamy sheen of the Milky Way was left behind. The history of witches is a history of need. You can see this by how people are always accusing witches of stealing the milk. The history of witches is also the history of a social contract. You can see this by how people sometimes went to the witches for medicine to keep themselves alive and sometimes pointed an accusing finger to keep themselves alive. When you are afraid, it can be difficult not to hate the people you need. Sometimes I think I am the one calling it all into my pail. Sometimes I think I am the mob. Sometimes I think none of it is real except the fear. And sometimes I'm miles outside the town of my life, watching the butterflies pollinate the fields of flowers, the rabbits dash in hunger. Any of these could be a witch carrying a mouthful of buttercream. This whole mountain might be nothing but small and large sips of milk that have been stolen or borrowed or brought back home to share. Surely this too could be a place where that great cow once put down a hoof. Thank you. Let's all unmute and give Shara and Kate a huge round of applause. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Shara. Thank you, Kate, for that incredible reading. Like, incredible. Um, and I think after a, like, a weird hard day, um, the weirdness that y'all brought, <laughs> the, the, um, the insight, the voices is, um, much appreciated. So I'm going to open up for questions. Um, and so if you have a question, please drop it in the chat. Um, but I'm going to start us off with a couple of things. I was just jotting down and noting as we were talking, um, as you all were reading. Um, and I have some questions for both of you, but I want to start with Shara. So you are, of course, writing about Robbie Burns. I'm not going to embarrass myself with my Scottish accent. Um, okay, I am Robbie Burns. Um, <laughs> but I, I wonder, because his work is so musical um, and his use of dialect, I wonder if or to what extent that influenced your own lyrical choices. Thank you, Erin. Yes, it's very fun. It's hard not to want to say it with that R, right? <laughs> it yes, it's a great thing to do. Um, it influenced it enormously. Uh, the voice of, of Burns or Burns is um, entirely uh, taken from his poems, his songs, his um, use of Scots vernacular alongside English, his prose. So one of the things I did when I was researching this book, and I say this to any students who are interested in historical fiction, or uh, this is a book of speculative fiction in poems. So, you know, it, it obtains in some ways to the kind of research a lot of historical um, novels and novelists have to go through. I learned how to hear and to read Scott's English um, in order to write this. So to answer the question of how indebted it is in order for me to feel I could to inhabit his voice, I had to not know anymore where his syntax ended and mine began. Hmm. Um, and there's so much of him in this book that is 
um, you know, that I don't even know. It's sort of one of those things of when you've read something to the point where you just don't realize that you're actually imbibing it. That's, that's what it was like for me working on this. Yeah. So it's, it sounds like you're talking about like, just what happens after immersion. Yeah, and um, I'm seeing a bunch of questions that seem um, interesting in tandem with this, but I will just say about the second one from Zoe, um, that this goes with the question of how you enter into um, the writing process where history is concerned. They did become realer to me um, as, as in the characters themselves were based on real people but as I went along writing, um, they felt as if they really did exist instead of could have existed. And I think that's a really strange notion and phenomena that I haven't experienced before as a poet. I'm not really a fiction writer, you know, so it's kind of ironic to me that I had a question that is rightly the territory of fiction writers. Um, other thoughts, just to throw this out there for students in particular, I have a background in theater, and a lot of this reminded me of the preparation to inhabit a role as an actor would. You know, you really have to leap into the consciousness of someone else, which means I had to know everything about this person's whole story in life. Sometimes only one fragment of it enters into the book. And similarly with the history, I felt I needed to know everything about the backdrop of history because history is a character in this book place is a character, memory is a character. So all of those different histories coming together, the more that I could know, the better I think I could be prepared to write the book. Thank you, Shara. And, um, and we have more questions, but I might throw part of that over to Kate to see how you all, um, because Kate, do you find that too? Um, you conduct a lot of research. so. What is your process like? Are you researching in order to put things into work or are you letting the research tell you where to go? Yeah, um, yeah so I guess what I'm doing, right, is I'm, I'm researching for fun just because like I'm looking for things to that delight or fascinate me. And then I get quickly obsessed. And then, um, and then I want to share this like kind of like amazing thing I've discovered with somebody. So then I write it. And then I show it to my readers, like my husband or, um, or friends. And they usually say to that first draft, this is very boring. If you wanted to write Wikipedia stubs, I think that's a job you could get. And, um, and this happens like every single time. Like you would think I would like, like see it coming, but I'm always like really hurt. And I'm like, how could you find it boring? So then I like end up like backing up and then trying to figure out like, okay, so then what was it about me as a person in that moment in time that made this thing spark? And how do I make that same spark happen for a reader who's in a different moment in time and a different body and a different life? And so then what I usually end up doing is getting very personal because that feels like a way to put them in a consciousness that can be delighted in the way I was delighted. So I think a lot of essayists and people who write personal essays maybe start with their lives and then are like dressing it up with historical fact. But for me, the, the personal stuff is just um, like, um, I'm not very private and I don't have a filter, so I don't mind sharing it, but I also don't care about it that much. Like it's really just there, it's there to bring you along so that you can just really get excited about a Tilbury. Like that's why so it's I'm, a trick. Yeah, it's psychologically manipulative and I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's not really a trick. It's like, it's like, I want us to know each other, right? Like, I, like you the writer and you the reader and hopefully by the time this thing happens, like maybe like I'm dead and you haven't been born yet, but like we feel like we met on the page and that feels very cool to me. Yeah, I love that. I love um, that sort of like conversation that you're predicting, like, you know, that or that you can't predict maybe. Um, so Kate, there's another question for you from Cassie in the chat um, about structure and form. Um, about how you developed your form? Uh, is it conscious or something that kind of happens naturally? Mm -hmm. um, so with poems, um, at least for Rue, I got really interested in the form of like, um, I guess like sometimes it was the form of the rant or like like my speaking is just like way too many clauses inside of run on sentences. 
And I became really interested. I'm like, what does the comma do? And like, what does the comma and the embedded clause do when you enjam it? Like, so like the poet side of me was really interested in how to play with the poetic form of just like out of control rambling from a neurotic person. So that was, um, so really that the, and part of the game was like, haha, it's poetry. It's supposed to be very like musical and it's supposed to be like, you know, you're supposed to do poet voice or you might be imagining poet voice. And so the idea that I was like, blah, 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 you to me was really funny. And it captured a very like my cranky kind of out of control spirit when I was writing the book. And then when I was writing essays, it was like exactly the opposite where I was like, oh, you think I'm going to make sense because it's prose and I'm going to go all the way to the far right of the page. I have news for you. So then I, I end up treating my paragraphs as stanzas and I end up treating sentences as lines. And, and there I'm kind of like using clauses not to create this like um, effective speech, but rather kind of the opposite and force you to slow down and be confronted with silences that make you meditate in the way that a line break in a poem might. So I'm just like being a little like oppositional defiant with my forms and genres all the time. Yeah, Shara, that actually seems, I know we have other questions, but that seems like it could tie over to you because you were just talking about all of this, like not blending of genres, but also maybe your refusal to acknowledge the solidity of their lines. I don't know if that, if there's anything there you want to grab onto. Sure. Um, you know, I love what you were saying, Kate, about silence. That was where I was actually thinking first, Erin, because there's the, I think silence is really, powerful insofar as it's what allows us to hear, like in music, the pauses are what allow the notes to have punctuated meaning and effect and resonance. So silence to me in a poem, whether it's the sejura or it's the punctuation or it's the use of line, I feel as if that's there's consonance there with the subject of this book, but also just always the, the way that silence works in poetry. Um, I suppose the other forms, what I'd say is I think Poetry is the oldest genre, and in it contains the genres we have chosen to split out now. So in its earliest forms, it was inseparable from song, uh, storytelling, and from drama. It was all of those things, and I'm interested in all of those things. So uh, this book is a more dramatic example, perhaps, but it was called to be that for me by the nature of the question that I was trying to pursue. Yeah, and I think along with that, Summer has a question about um, how one of the characters in a, a No Ruined Stone is, is memory. You were talking about that a little bit earlier. Um, and she was asking how it entwines with the history of the other characters or, or how memory has shaped your own history. I think that's a really beautiful question and wonderful observation, Summer. Um, for me, the particular kind of memory that is informing this book and pretty much has informed most of my books, but this is more specifically so, is the idea that you inherit the memory of your ancestors and particularly that around trauma. So in this book, um, Isabella is, is inherited her grandmother's memory of the, of the Middle Passage. It's not just her own memory of, of her time on, this, on the plantation, that she's being haunted by. It's the memory of, of her grandmother and actually of the people who died in the Middle Passage. And that is something that is really a particular notion of memory as a character here. The ghost, the duppy, that figure that is haunting Isabella here is one of the, is, is your thing, I think you're right, the character in this book of memory. In my own life, I'm, I, I don't know how to not hear the dead. I feel as if I'm always talking to them. And I don't mean that literally, um, but I do mean that very much as a writer, but even as a person, you know, the people we've loved, we continue to have conversations with them. And in so doing, we're keeping them alive in us. And I think, yeah, um, memory for me is just always the past and the present and hearing also the opposite as being true. Yeah, there's there's so much I, I was just thinking like I really wish we were in the same room right now, you know. Um this feels alive and important. So, but I'm really grateful to all these questions. Um I have uh, I'm gonna throw one over to Kate from Zoe. Uh in uh Dr. Mulberg's class, we had a text quest where we went to the library and picked books about a chosen subject or topic, uh, Zoe's chosen banshees, which I totally respect. Um 
what was your process uh, like in choosing plants historically used as uh, birth control as your main topic? Like, and maybe, you know, how did you find that as it um, process, et cetera? Yeah, so, uh, well, I was living in Warrensburg when I started writing the book, um, a, little, a little homestead, um, like maybe 10 minutes from campus. And, um, and um, yeah, so we were like, my husband was homesteading. So we had like the garden area with like the pigs and the chickens and stuff. But then like, there was a whole pasture that was like too much to deal with. So we were just letting it go, hoping it would go back to prairie. And, um, and it was very slow to go back to prairie. It had been like, sprayed and herbicided and like it had been it had been ill treated for a long time so like only the scrappiest plants were coming back but um I had this like little thing that every morning where I would go out and I would like pick a plant and be like I'm going to interview you today plant and um and so I would like you know go back I'd have my like little like my like I actually have my little bag of books I'd like take out into the like walk out the front door with the dog and the baby and the little baby carrier and then the bag of books and like I was like ready to pick the plant, like do the research out there and then come back home. Sometimes I'd harvest it if I felt confident I'd identify something edible that I wouldn't kill myself with. Um, anyway, so I would just like try to know them in all these ways. And then, um, and so I was writing their folklore and I was writing their like medicinal uses. And the thing was like almost every single plant I looked up somewhere in some, somewhere it said used to provoke the menses, which is a euphemism for birth control. So um, like all of them. And, you know, so those of you like, like, yeah, so there's all of this discourse um, about like what it means to be natural, what it means to be a woman or a person with a uterus. And the, the, the notion is like we were what I, I mean, my upbringing, my religious upbringing was like I was made to make babies and I to be walking in this field like right like with like who made flowers and why and and it seemed like they were suggesting that I was also like potentially as a complicated and multifaceted as a flower and that I could be a lot of things um, and still be fulfilling a sense of purpose. So um, but I was that library that you were taken to um, is where I, I would wander in there and pick books off the shelves all the time. And I wrote a whole book about hot air balloonists because of the hot air balloon um, section of the shelf. And I also had a student while I was teaching at UCM who um, he was a non-traditional student, his, the union jobs dried up, he was a carpenter and his last job before he lost his union job was building that library. And so then he was a composition student in my class and um, like he would like caress the elevator because he was so proud of their work on that elevator. So I just want you to know whenever you go in that library, like a carpenter who was a really exquisite writer built that library and it was like his favorite project before he switched to writing essays. So we're gonna send you some pictures of all our students just against the elevator. Hey, I was on. gonna say that I was so interested in your root poems because there's one mention of um, Nancy's role with um, inducing abortion, being able to have that knowledge on the plantation. And in Jamaica, there's a particular root, Cerise, that is still used. Um, it's, you know, bush medicine, herbal medicine, um, but I was really interested in what you were just saying about how you find your material. And it strikes me that you start out here looking at things that you're really curious about, and then it moves toward the personal. Um, and just fascinating to me as somebody who is always looking inward. And even the pieces of things that I've learned that I'm interested in, maybe I didn't know I was going to use them, they've, but they've lived in me usually before I use them. So I find that really interesting. I heard that a lot when you're reading your essay too, which I really love that essay. Um, just the way that you, and like, I know it's not accurate. Somebody told me this recently, but I'm gonna say it anyway. You magpie things. Somebody corrected me that magpies actually don't build their nests that way. But I, I was so distraught. I'm I was like, so upset, I thought they did. They said it's not magpies. It's some. It's it's like a fiction. But we're gonna just pretend we didn't hear that. Yeah. You, your way of collecting is reminding me of that. It's really beautiful. Just wanted to. It's a comment. It's not a question. Oh. Really. I like that you kind of like that the the eye of the needle works either way, right? Like we can go through it either way and come out and get. Mm -hmm. them. But also like your your methods are like so intimidating to me in a way, right? Because it's like how do you how do you, well, at least for me, it's hard. Like I reach a point where if I go too far, I can't do anything anymore because I just become aware of everything I don't know. So I have to stop while I'm still kind of thirdly cocksure that I think I can tell it. Um, 
but but then later realized I really was missing stuff. So I guess I'm just like, how do you, I guess, how do you stop or how do you accept that there's maybe a limit to what you can know or, may, or are you a completist and you just like stop when you know? I don't know. I mean, that's the danger of research, right? You know, so for this book, I worked for three years, but really it was because I was also trying to find my way into the subject. So research was doing that, but there is no end to knowing things about any topic you could choose. Maybe you just need enough to feel you're ready. Um, you know, and for this book, for me anyway, I think I was carrying this from I was all my life. I was on a collision course with this book. It's what I've been thinking, you know, that the way I look, my surname, how many times have I been asked in my life, are you Scottish, you know, and I always reply with, you know, the same answer, so practice, it's, it's, it's annoying. Well, my father, I'm Jamaican, my father's, you know, father's a black Jamaican, it's patrilineal, so if I'm Scottish, not in the way you're thinking, you know, but I thought about all of that when I was writing this, Kate, that that's the origin somewhere in there is that the, the history is in me. And I think you said it too, it's just that I tend to start with that as the point of understanding the material, um, is that I have some connection to it, it's really obvious, you know? Um, and then I have to work to expand it, whereas you seem to work from the outside in, which is fascinating, I think. I also am really impressed by the way, I love that, you all were just like coming together on that but right like the different if we're thinking about right our students takeaways one is that there's no really such thing as like too much learning <laughs> right or like um and that we don't always have to know where to what end or where we're going right to but that there's a joy in the process um and discovery in the process and i think mm -hmm. to wrap us up um jenny put up a question that i think our students are really interested in um, many of them are incredibly talented, thinking about grad schools, thinking about making a writing life. So um, if you could talk to us a little bit about how you all just, you know, um, came on this path to writing. Um, and then, you know, how do you uh, sustain it as a practice in your life? How do you make time? Um, who do you have to kill to get time? I'm just, you know, maybe that's my own life. Uh, what rituals, moments of stagnancy, frustration, anything you have to share with us would be great. Kate, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, um, I I knew I was a poet when I was very young, but I didn't write. And so at some point I was, I was, I had been a bad high school teacher and then I like quit being a high school teacher and then I was a nanny. And then I was like, oh, if I don't start actually writing, like I'm like, I'm a writer, but if I don't actually write something, I'm just a nanny and that's gonna be the rest of my life. And then I just started writing every day um, with that kind of like sense of like, um, my whole life is going to end pretty soon. I don't know. I was like 23, but I was like, it's all going to be over so soon. Um, so I, I would say for me, writing every day is really important. Um, I like project books because it gives me a place to start every day. So I always, I just have this rule. I have to write a page every day. And um, if, um, if I can't write something with feelings or some story or some like thought I'm using, then I do research um, and I just fill a page with notes. And then hopefully the next day that can be a jumping off point. And then when I Get to the end of a notebook i start a new notebook and i use the previous notebook like i'll read through it and try to find good stuff and then i try to build it up in the next notebook so i'm never really writing anything important it's always just a page of notes every morning and it keeps the pressure down so i don't feel overwhelmed but it the poems are gradually accruing um, over the course of um, notebooks and months I think it's so wonderful to have two of us here to answer the same question because it really illustrates the diversity with which people approach the writing process. Um, I write almost the opposite, which is so interesting to me to hear you say you write every day. I don't write every day. I don't write for long periods. Silence is a huge part of what I'm interested in as a poet, but also seems to be what happens between books for me. Um, and then it comes in spurts for me, and then I work furiously at it. So this book, I did do research, but there are times where I just don't write anything for a year at a time. And it doesn't trouble me. Um, and I think it's because the way that I've always started writing, and I didn't know I was going to be a writer when I was young, I didn't have that forethought, is because I feel provoked to speak. 
something bothers me enough that I feel provoked to speak. And every time I'm finished, including this book, and I know I shouldn't say it because I sound like a liar. I always think that's it, I'm done. I've said everything I can say, I'm finished now. And then lo and behold, <laughs> something with hibernation of you know that silence I'm speaking about, something dwell, like sort of bubbles up again. Now, this is not particularly useful advice though. I think case is the better advice personally. Um, you know, I'm not advocating just hanging around and waiting for things to fall from the sky, but I guess I advocate active waiting, maybe reading for long periods for me between books. Um, in this case, like I said, taking notes for years and thinking about it. But then, you know, I wrote a third of the book in 12 days. So that does not, it doesn't, it's not a writing process. It's, it's more like a sporadic writing with a lot of reading and thinking in between. Yeah. But I think you should all do what Kate said. I think you get a lot more done if you write every day. <laughs> Don't listen to me. <laughs> so. I like that all of our processes are so opposite. Um, at the same time. Well, Shara, Kate, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your time with us and for your gorgeous, um, important writing and and um, invoking the witches just in time for Halloween, um, yeah. and for and for taking the time to answer these questions. We really appreciate you. Um, so let's just give Shara and Kate one last big round of applause and we'll sign off for the night. Thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming.